Andrew Singleton, and he will be presenting the third Hans Moll Memorial Lecture in Religion and the Social Sciences here in the Humanities Research Center, where we begin by paying our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people on whose traditional lands the ANU is built. So this is a lecture series made possible by an endowment from the late Hans Moll, um, whose work is a topic of today's presentation. He was uh, a research fellow in the Institute for Advanced Studies here at the ANU in the 60s. Previous lectures in this series were delivered by Marion Maddox from Macquarie University, and, uh, and last year, Ant Anthony Scioli from King State College in New Hampshire. Um, but today being Remembrance Day, I thought it might be appropriate to comment briefly on the topic of war and peace in Hans Moll's work very briefly. So this topic appears in, in two interconnected ways. So theoretically, he was concerned in the relationship or the dialectic between chaos and order. But autobiographically, he made reference in his work to his own experiences during World War II, when he was sent to a German prison camp for his involvement with the Dutch resistance. Uh, he writes in his uh, major theoretical work, Identity and the Sacred, towards the end of 1943, I found myself in prison and then prison with hard labor. And he writes, the severest shock to my system was strangely enough, not the refined Nazi cruelty or the digging for unexploded bombs, but the gripping discovery that intellectuality was dysfunctional for morale. Instead, Moll realized the deep commitment, and he goes on to say whether to Nazism, to communism, or to Jesus Christ, was correspondingly functional for morale. And morale proved to be the sole prerequisite for survival. So Moll, he recognized the, the, the complexities of religion in war and peace. He wrote about incidents in World War I in which German, French, and British soldiers those famous incidents where they climb out of their trenches to celebrate Christmas, but also to sing and play football. So Moll observed that there's something in religion, but he also realized that it's present in sport and music that is stronger than national divisions and wars. But of course, contradictory religious justifications were claimed by all the different sides in, in the war. Uh, so Moll recognized there can be something liberating about religion, but he also argued that religion is bound to and, and possibly corrupted by the all embracing powerful demands of nations at war. But in his final point, he, he recognized that religion, but also, as I said, sports and music constitute a global universal uniting elements in existence momentarily outstripping religion's particular and tribal side. Now, there's absolutely no way to segue from trench warfare to today's guest and today's lecture. So I'm not even going to try. We'll just forget about what I've been talking about for the, for the previous few minutes and introduce uh, Andrew Singleton. So Andrew's professor of sociology and social research at Deakin University. And before that, he was a lecturer in sociology for many years at Monash. We'll see that Andrew's an expert both on uh, qualitative research and also quantitative research on religion. Andrew's the author and co-author of three books, The Spirit of Generation Y, Young People's Spirituality in a Change in Australia, published in 2007, Religion, Culture and Society, A Global Approach, published in 2014, and Freedoms, Faiths and Futures, Teenage Australians on Religion, Sexuality and Diversity, published last year by Bloomsbury, um, and co-authored with uh, Anna Halifer, who did a, a, a public lecture earlier in the year for the HRC. Uh, it's also co-authored with ANU's Mary Lou Rasmussen and with the late Gary Baumer, who was also an admirer of the, of the work of, of Hans Moll. So Andrew's also the author of, uh, of several dozen journal articles, including an article published very recently in a journal called Nova Religio, on the Ballarat Spiritualist Federation and the Spiritualist Church Movement in Australia. So in that spirit, Andrew will today be communing with the ghost of social science past, revisiting Hans Moll's The Faith of Australians and uh, to better understand religion in Australian society in the post-World War II era. So I'm very happy to hand over to, to Andrew Singleton. Uh, thanks so much, Ibrahim. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and custodians 
on the land in which I'm talking today and to pay my respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging. And uh, it's a real um, privilege to be able to come up to Canberra and talk to you. Uh, I used to live in Canberra in 2014 and uh, I love it. And I took a little walk around the lake before and went to Civic, which is Civic. <laughs> anyway, um, it's always great to come back. And uh, special thanks to Ibrahim for inviting me into the Hans Mole family uh, for, uh, for the trust. And when I hear about those other speakers, I think they've set a very high bar. So maybe, you know, that was the tipping point, well, but I'll do my best um, today. Uh, we will talk a little bit of statistics, but uh, I'm committed to making that interesting. So um, I, I hope it will be interesting uh, for you. All right. So in today's presentation, uh, I want to talk about Hans Moll's quantitative uh, study of Australian religion because he was the very first person to do it in a kind of large way. And uh, he sort of set a benchmark and a whole set of precedents that our scholars have followed uh, since that time. I, I want to talk about a study that he did in 1966 when he was here at the National University and he called it the Religion in Australia Study. So I want to kind of go back to that and re-examine his data. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, examine his old data, but using uh, newer advanced statistical techniques. It's going to be much more interesting than that sounds. I know that's like Friday afternoon killer, but trust me, it's going to be good. Uh, and uh, the statistics that I've done, it's like kind of bringing a cannon into a knife fight because it's it's going to be quite, you know, re-examining Moll's data in, in quite a, an interesting way, I hope. Um, and then I'll sort of look back to his pioneering empirical sociology of religion and the contribution that he made to understanding post-war religion in Australia, because I think that's one of his major achievements. As his career progressed, he kind of really moved towards a whole lot of theoretical stuff, but he definitely started off as a kind of empiricist and a quant person. And so I, that's the part of his legacy that I want to explore today. Uh, Ibrahim has already talked a little bit about um, myself. So I'm just quite blurry, isn't it? Um, so I am a qualitative and quantitative sociologist. My official title is Professor of Sociology and Social Research. And, I insisted that the head of school let me have that title, the social research part, because um, I like to sort of dabble in quant a lot and qual not as much, but still a fair bit, and a lot of ethnography uh, as well. Um, I have research interests in um, teenage religion, which is the subject of that book that uh, we published last year, which came out of an ARC project on teenagers' religion and diversity in. Australia with Mary Lou Rasmussen, who's here at ANU. She hasn't come today, so I'll break her later. And of course, uh, Gary, um, who died last year. He had a number of his books on his casket during the funeral service, which was on Zoom. And I think that might have been on it. So I'm not sure, but <laughs> I was a bit like, that's really expensive, a book. So I hope that um, we can get it back. But it's just... It's just come out in paperback next week. Uh, so if you want to grab a, a cheaper copy, ask me and I'll provide you a discount code. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I know I've just finished a project on spiritualism in Australia with uh, Matt Tomlinson, who's an anthropologist here at the ANU. He's not here because he's decided to go overseas this week. So I'll talk to him later uh, as well. And that was also funded by uh, the ARC. We've got a discovery project on that. And so we've been, uh, doing all sorts of qualitative research ethnography with spiritualists all around Australian spiritualists, uh, the, the religion that contacts the dead through mediumship. We were amazed to discover that in 1975, uh, a medium came out from England. Her name was Doris Collins, and she did a platform demonstration of mediumship here at the ANU in the Coombs Lecture Theatre, and she charged $2.00. Uh, per person for that. So um, there you go. And in fact, there's been a, a spiritualist association in Canberra since the 1970s, and it still goes today in, in Pierce, and, and that did a lot of his, um, uh, his ethnography there. Anyway, I could talk about spiritualism all day, but we might save that for the, um, the Moldovan wine afterwards. All right. So I'm going to begin by talking about um, polling our religion in Australia, because that was the sort of the, the forerunner of what it was that Hans Moll did. Uh, in 1966, Gallup 
uh, conducted a poll of, um, of Australians. It was a representative sample of Australian voters, which was at that time people aged 21 and over. And they were doing monthly opinion polls. And every now and then they would slip in a question about something to do with religion in public life. And in July 1966, their question was, should the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches, should or should they try and not unite? And 66% of uh, the sample thought that they should. So that's a nice sentiment. And that's sort of almost straight after Vatican II. So there seemed to be a kind of ecumenical spirit in Australia. And going all the way back to the first Gallant Polls in the late 1940s, they were asking a question about, say, religion in school, sometimes about how often people go to services and worship and so on. But despite this polling and the fact that in the census we've been mapping uh, religious affiliation since, you know, um, the you know, prior to federation of the colonial censuses, scholars back in the 60s uh, did not know much more about the ordinary religious lives of Australians. So we kind of knew which denomination they identified with um, and how often they would go to services of worship. But beyond that, no clue who, what, when. And that was sort of changing in the discipline from the 1960s and particularly sociologists in the United States had started doing bespoke surveys about people's religious practice, beliefs, values, and so on. People like uh, Charles Block, Rodney Stark, and Gerard Linsky were doing it in the United States. In 1966, Hans Moll, who is a sociologist here at the ANU, he followed the lead of his American counterparts by inaugurating the very first major survey of religion in Australia that he called the Religion in Australia Survey. And that he conducted that in from April to about July of 1966. Uh, because it was too heavy to carry his books on the aeroplane, I took a photograph of them yesterday, but then I noticed that Abraham was a supply of copies. So um, that's good. I uh, appreciate that. And, and that's his, also Hans's um, autobiography um, that came out, I think, in 2004. Is that right? And Ibrahim managed to score a copy. I, I, I don't know how he did it, but. Um, so, locals will be familiar with the, uh, the lifeline that they have. <laughs> the source of all sorts of, 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 of obscure academic treasures. Right, right, including this. But it, the spine, Tim Pop Preacher is printed upside down on the spine of that book. So. Um, yeah, anyway, I digress. So he wrote two books out of his Religion in Australia project. The first is Religion in Australia, which came out in 1971. By that stage, he'd moved to McMaster University in Canada, but it took him about four or five years in order to write up the, the findings from his survey. And then he kind of reprised Religion in Australia uh, in 1985 with the book Faith of Australians, which is probably the one that he's more commonly known for because it was part of that studies in society series that Alan and Amwin did uh, throughout the 1980s. So if you were a graduate student of sociology or an undergraduate student of sociology in the late 80s and 90s, like I was, there was lots of these, 30 of these books on everything from class consciousness to um, the faith of Australians. And in a lot of ways, it's just a kind of reprisal of the substantive part of religion in Australia with some extra data, but not quite as much data as a bit of hope, which I'll get to uh, in a while. So the substantive part of what I'm going to talk about today is embedded in the Religion in Australia book, but also the survey that he did. I want to talk a little bit about how he created the survey because, like I said, it was the very first major Australian survey of um, religious behaviour, practice and values. Hans Moll, he completed his PhD at Columbia University in New York and he was quite a nomad. He went to New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the United States. He was also a devout Christian and an ordained Presbyterian pastor as well, which was a kind of side hustle that he, he, he did the whole time that he was an academic. And there is no doubt that his Christianity deeply influences his approach to academics, uh, academic scholarship, but also even the ideology that he brought to understanding the survey data that he uses. <clears throat> 
Now, back in those days, in order to get into a graduate program at somewhere like Columbia, you had to pass courses in statistics and social research methods. So I, a lot of students will breathe a sigh of relief now that they don't have to do that. But back then it was compulsory and you'd have to do all your chi-squares and all of that by, um, by hand um, and so on. So thank goodness for the invention of statistical programs. Whilst he was there, uh, Hans Moll took Charles Glock's uh, sociology of religion classes and he tells us in Tim Pot Preacher he got straight A's in those classes. At that time, Glock was the director of Columbia's Bureau of Applied Social Research. So it was a, a kind of major sort of social research engine that was going on there in the United States. And they had a particular focus on uh, doing surveys about religious, religion and religious belief and practice. With all of this kind of uh, cogitating in his mind, Hans Moll came to the ANU and decided to do this particular um, survey. He doesn't expressly state in Tin Pot Preacher or the other books why he did it, but it just to me, it just seemed like that was what was going on. That was the mood of the time, the kind of the intellectual fashion, and he was very much uh, interested in that and also completely capable of doing that kind of research. He uh, was funded by the ANU Sociology Department and he talks about um, being able to scrape together $5,500 for the survey, which is the teenage religion survey that we did in 2017, which was coming out of our ARC grant. That was a nationally representative um, probability telephone sample. And in order to get that done, it costs north of $300,000. Uh, and if you wanna get really high quality uh, sort of online survey panel done by um, the Social Research Centre, which is actually owned by the ANU. It's about $100,000. So even adjusting for inflation, I reckon uh, it was a bit of a bargain, this particular research. Um, the original analysis of the data was conducted using a mainframe IBM computer. I can imagine it somewhere in the, in the bowels of the... Uh, the Coombs building rumbling away uh, with a whole lot of kind of computer nerds sort of busy uh, pouring oil and water into it to keep it running. Um, he did some pretty good statistical analysis of this data. He doesn't say which program he used. And now SPS is the kind of, um, SPSS, sorry, is that this is the sort of industry standard. It was released in 1968, shortly before he did the bulk of his analysis. And I think he might have used it. Um, if you're not interested in statistics and stats program, you're probably thinking, whoopee doo. But for me, I thought that's quite interesting um, because I still use SPSS today on a, a little IBM computer uh, and, it, and it, it kind of runs like a rocket. And I bet he would have loved to have had a crack at that. The data is now held at the Australian Data Archive, which is also here at the Australian National University, and it's available for download. Uh, and I've checked, it's been downloaded 12 times, and I think I'm responsible for about four or five of those downloads. So I don't think a lot of people are using it apart from me, um, but it's a treasure trove for those of us who are interested in historical statistics. There's my slide gone. There we go. All right, so um, just the survey itself. Obviously, I had to apply and get permission from the Australian Data Archive to use the data. Unfortunately, it didn't have all its labels and all sorts of things into it. So I had to spend a lot of time inputting all of that with Moll's original code book and so on. So it, it took uh, quite a lot of time and I had to make a few educated guesses because a few things seemed to be missing or uh, not quite clear. The original survey, um, it, was, it was done in two ways. There was a bigger kind of survey, which I'll talk about in a moment, which was done like door to door where someone would knock on the door and say, would you like to do my survey? And people said yes, or less often no. And then the researchers also left this sort of tick a box, tick a box questionnaire uh, and that's what it looks like. Um, and so you can look at all of that stuff on the Australian Data Archive. Now he calls it the religion in Australia survey, but it's not exactly that. And I'll explain why once I've had this drink. Thank you. All right. I'll talk a little bit about the survey and then I'll talk about why it's not religion in Australia. 
So it was administered to a sample of randomly selected households. Um, and it had two parts, a kind of bigger survey, which was survey A, and that was everyone in the household was counted in that survey, just like in the census. And within that, the adults of the house were given the second survey, survey B, which asked more intimate questions. So survey A looked a little bit like the census and presumably one of the two of the adults or whoever was in the household would fill that in on behalf of the other people um, in the household. It was a random sample and that's kind of common for surveys back then, less common now. Uh, but it, it means that it's got um, the capacity to do probability statistics on it. He managed to get 4,201 people to do his main survey, which is a fantastic number. Mm -hmm. 2,500 adults and 1,594 children. The data on the children is lost for all time, so it's not in the Australian Data Archive. But I think that would have been amazing to have historical data about uh, children in the 1960s, but it's lost for all time. I, I don't know where it is. Um, so the one that you can get from the Australian Data Archive has got the 2,607 adults in it. Uh, and survey B, which was kind of within survey A, there's more detailed questions about values, beliefs, political preferences. Um, it asked about premarital sex. Uh, it asked about drunks. You know, what do you think of drunks? What do you think about gambling? Um, and that was 1,832 adults. And um, only about 1,600 actually did the whole thing. So they were incomplete cases. And Hansmore actually published in a psychology journal an article about the relationship between religion and attitudes to premarital sex, which I uh, discovered in the course of preparing for this presentation. The way he did it, just as for you can stats nerds or whatever, he randomly selected uh, households to participate in the study using a multi-stage probability sample, which is kind of the gold standard. He actually piggybacked on someone who'd already kind of set up the sample frame, so it was easy for him to kind of design the sample. And this is the best part, just 12% of dwellings in the sample frame did not participate. So when the interviewer knocked on the door, person opened it, do you want to do my survey? Only 12% said, go away. This is the dark secret about polling now, right? But those telephone, those random telephone surveys, somewhere between 90 to 95% of people say, I don't want to do it. So you've got a non-response rate north out of nine out of 10 people and only between five and 10% commit to doing the survey. So telephone surveys now, household surveys now, mail out surveys now, they're broken. So that's why we've now shifted uh, to doing the online probability panels, but that's, you know, we can talk about that, the drinks or not, we'll talk about something more interesting like spiritualism, but anyway. <laughs> All right, this is the kicker. Despite its name, it's not a national survey. It's limited to urban and regional parts of New South Wales and Victoria and urban parts of Southern Tasmania, which is basically Hobart and Richmond, which has got a nice bridge. And Hans Moll estimates that he got to about 68% of the Australian population. However, when he talks about the survey in both his books, he says it's religion in Australia, and he kind of concedes that it's about Australians, though it's not, it's not properly. Um, and I guess for me, the question like this is, can a partial sample be taken as representative of the Australian population when almost fully a third didn't get asked? And obviously not asking a third is better than the survey now where you don't ask sort of 90% of people. So it's not bad. But um, if you want to benchmark it, uh, which I've done, so um, this is on religious identification in the sample. So on the left-hand side, that's how people in his sample identified. That's from the census, which was done sort of exactly the same time as his survey in 1966. And uh, that's this, the Australian population as well. So you can see that his sample overestimates the proportion of people who identified with the Church of England, Anglican. It's about on par for those who identify with the Catholic Church, about on par with Methodists, um, overestimates the proportion of uh, Presbyterians and the rest, that's not my language, that's what Hans Moll said, the rest, <laughs> you can see, um, 
he's he's got it out by 70 percent so um it's not bad it didn't weight the data which is what we would do now to kind of adjust for these imbalances but all things considered given the high response rate the fact that you've got about 68 percent of the population the fact that it's a bit wonky but not too bad like I think it's okay. I think it's all right. So we technically should call it the religion in New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania, but that's a mouthful. So let's just go with the shorthand religion in Australia and um, just acknowledge these kinds of shortcomings or sins uh, when you look at any of the data. All right. So the best part about this survey is that it's like a snapshot of the faith of Australians in the 1960s. Now, I just want to say when Hans Moll talks about faith, like he's talking about Christianity, at the time of the survey in Australia, it was about 80,000 people who uh, identified with a religion that wasn't Christianity, whether it's uh, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, uh, Jewish people, um, and he, he wasn't interested in them. So now we would create surveys that look at the different kinds of religious traditions that people follow and bespoke questions that address the ways in which those religions are practiced, organized, et cetera, et cetera. He, he didn't do uh, any of that uh, and he, he doesn't make that, that kind of concession. And of course now, you know, such a large proportion of the population doesn't identify with the religion at all. Back in the mid sixties, kind of like everybody did uh, because you couldn't actually in the census tick that you had no religious identification, you just had to tick the not stated box. And you'll see that that influences some of the, the, the findings in this. So the faith of Australians in the 1960s. One of the things that Hans Moll was really interested, I mean, the book's quite an epic, I don't know if you've read it, but he goes through, it's like, it's forensic, the relationship between religion and school, religion and morality, religion and gambling, drinking, uh, uh, education, it's, it's exhaustive. Um, in it, its kind of analysis, which means it's kind of like an incredible piece of social research. But what he wanted to do is understand the relationship between belief and morality. And he was particularly interested in seeing, are the most religious Australians the ones who are kind of uh, the most moral, uh, the most um, committed to social good, all those kinds of things. And I think he obviously had an agenda to kind of demonstrate that that's the case. The way he went about exploring this relationship between uh, morality and values and religion was to come up with what he called clusters of belief. So if you've ever done a, you know, if you ever done statistics, you do this cluster analysis where you, you look at someone and you don't just look at, say, say, what their identification is or how often they go to church, but you might look at, say, their religious practices and beliefs and so on. So what Hans Moll did was, because he didn't have the kind of super sophisticated statistical software. He looked at how often people went to services of worship. Uh, he looked at how often they prayed. And also he looked at their belief in God. And he came up with these clusters based on just those three variables. And this is what he found. I, I won't read it out, but because um, it's, it's kind of a little bit um, exhausting. But he found these six key types in the Australian population. So they're the types on the left-hand side and it's the proportion of the uh, sample on the right-hand side. So taking into account the fact that it's not a kind of uh, true national survey uh, and some other limitations with the data, I think that's the kind of ballpark figure about these proportions in the population. It's not super accurate, but it's probably not too bad. Um, to use the Bob Dylan approach statistics, you know, the answer is blowing in the wind. So if the wind is blowing a particular way, then that's likely to be the trend that you've discovered, even if you're not sort of super accurate about it. <clears throat> so you had Orthodox believers, uh, which were people who went to church regularly. They prayed every day and without doubt in their hearts, they knew that God existed. Private believers, which I think is this incredible group of people. They, they're praying all the time. They have no doubt about the fact that God exists, but they never darken the door of the house of worship. Public believers who are the opposite, where they will be seen at the house of worship, but you never catch them praying, or um, and consequently they have doubts about whether God exists. And believing secularists, vacillating secularists, and consistent secularists. <clears throat> 
Of course, the consistent secularists are the ones now, the non-religious, the atheists, the agnostics, um, and they're the proportions um, in the sample. So uh, really a quite a clever piece of social research for the 1960s. Um, and he was able to demonstrate a relationship between a whole lot of values and these particular types. All right, so he was able to create his composite measure of religiosity thanks to the statistical programs and computing available to him at ANU, which was good for the time, but not by today's standards. The technology, though, limited him to either or categorizations. So there's a little room in his, his approach for fuzziness, equivocation, slight overlap, or complexity in his model, because the computer's kind of going, if you believe, go to church and pray, you're in that category. And if you don't, you're in that category. But, you know, we know the way that faith or not faith is lived is far more muddy and complex than that. A bit like chocolate. We've got people who like dark chocolate. We've got people who like white chocolate. We've got people who like milk chocolate. But then maybe on a Tuesday, you'll have a bit of dark chocolate, but you're mostly a white chocolate person. Why? I don't know. I don't even think that's a confectionery worth talking about but you know this is this is what life is like it's 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 messier than that so he couldn't he couldn't get into that you can tell where this is leading because i'm going to solve it right um so if people couldn't fit into his deterministic categorizations then he couldn't include them at all and then also within that he, he couldn't account for this kind of sloppiness that we've got in in the ways in which people have faith or don't have faith or equivocate and so on. Um, the other thing is, because he didn't have like the, the, the computing power that's available to us, he wasn't able to use all the data that he had. So he had a lot of data, uh, but he couldn't ask and include it, or he, he could ask, but he couldn't include it in his model. Um, and so I wonder, you know, if we chucked all of this into the, into the mix, and added all this new insight, would it produce a different understanding of religion in Australia? Would it confound his model or would it, it give us an insight to the fact that he's quite prescient? So that's what I've attempted uh, today. And I've done something called latent class analysis. Uh, if you don't know what latent class analysis is, I'm going to give you latent class 101 in about 30 seconds. So it's increasingly finding favour in the social sciences. Uh, it's a really great way of identifying clusters of beliefs, behaviours and values in the population. And we use it for all sorts of things. So I've done latent class analysis on the ways in which teenagers find out about uh, information about sexual health and so on. Um, and also uh, in the other book on teenage religion, we did it uh, as well. Or I did it, um, I did those statistics. And, and what it looks is that how you answered the survey and then it groups you how much you're like people in the population. You're more like them than like them. You're more like a dark chocolate person or you're more a straight milk chocolate person or you're a bit of a mixing person. So it kind of pushes you into those categories based on probabilities. The chances are you're more like them than like them. That's how it works. So it's, it's nice and gentle. And there's a bit of overlap, which you'll see. So the beautiful thing about LCA is that someone that Hans Moll was unable to classify can actually be placed with other like-minded people. Um, and so what I did was construct a model of the faith types of Australians that starts with his, his three key variables, which was religious attendance, frequency of prayer and belief in God. And I chucked in a whole lot of other stuff into the mix uh, to come up with a kind of revised set of types, which I'm going to show you. Uh, in just a minute. I won't get into the weeds, but I did all sorts of statistical modeling. It's all good, trust me, it's nice. Um, and uh, I did it on a program called um, Leighton Gold, which costs thousands of dollars. Thank you very much to uh, Deakin University. Uh, and the only copy that Deakin has happens to be on my notebook computer and no one else's. <laughs> so, have to get through me. All right, and rather than going through all of this, I've printed you your own copy and I'll talk you through it. Uh, some people have the furrow brow, but trust me, I'm going to I'm going to make it simple, um, and I won't you know, I won't belabor the point. I printed forty because that's how much Ibrahim told me might be coming. So you can take one for yourself. Yeah. So, and I didn't get the um, 
Yeah, and it isn't the right way to do things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 right, we're going to do something too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right. I'd like to wander around, but I'm not allowed to wander because I'm on Zoom cam, so I have to stand here and be. Um... So. You know, Hans Moll gave these people the original name, right? And they actually still apply. So I went with it. I mean, I came up with different labels, but I thought, oh, it's too confusing. And so if you look down on your piece of paper, you can see all the variables that I chuck into the mix. So we've got attendance at services of worship, whether people pray, their belief about God. One of the nice things that Hans Moll did was not only did he ask them, how often do you go to services of worship? He said, did you go last week? That's one of the things that we've discovered about people who say who, who go to services of worship. They oh yeah, I go all the time. But in actual fact, they don't. Um, they just say that they do. So by asking, did you go last week? It gets to the really, really people who are taking this seriously. He also asked whether people attended uh, other church meetings, uh, small groups and, and other things like that, which is, Kind of, I think a really kind of good measure of how committed someone is to their local parish or congregation. Uh, and then on the other side, um, this is fantastic. He, he asked people how often they tune into religious services on radio or television. And I did a bit of background research and religious programming was really quite common right up until the end of the 60s. And so it was a really reasonable question to ask. He had a whole bunch of questions about morality, but this is the one that sort of stood out when I was doing the analysis, you know, like panning for gold. This is the one that had the fleck of gold. And it's to the extent people agree with the statement, it does not matter what one believes as long as one leads a moral life. So the kind of humanist position is you can believe whatever you want. And the source of that can be anything provided you're a good person. So spiritualists, Spiritualists believe one of the tenets of their philosophy is personal responsibility. Whereas a super religious person would say, no, no, my faith system is the one that is the kind of North Star for morality. And then obviously, you know, the most religious people are going to have affective religious experiences. Uh, and so he asked whether people had ever felt they were in the presence of God uh, and ever had a sense of being saved in Christ. I wondered if this was a nod to Billy Graham, because of course in 1959 he toured Australia and yeah, you know, like more than 100,000 people were saved, but Hans Moll doesn't mention Billy Graham at all. And I suspect, and Ibrahim could probably confirm this, he probably didn't like that kind of style of religion. Altar calls and being saved is not his belly week. So um, the way you read this table is you look down at each column and that gives the profile of these groups. Orthodox believers, private believers, public believers, believing secularists, fascinating secularists, and consistent secularists. And you can kind of see how they kind of have some overlap, but also distinctiveness. And that's what Latin class is trying to do, is eventually push you to a group that you're most like. So if I go back to the first page, you can see our Orthodox believers, like 99% of them, say that they go to church regularly. And if you drop down to that, 84% uh, of them said that they went to church in the last week. By contrast, the private believers, who this really interesting group who have religious practices, but they never seem to go to church that often. So they didn't go last week, but um, you know they might go. Whereas a public believer in that middle column, they say they go regularly and dropping down there, most of them went to church last week, but when it comes to prayer, they're not so into it. Now, when I look at this really carefully, and you can do this in your own time rather than me wasting your time, I reckon the proportion of people in his sample, and by extension Australians, who are super religious is only about 15%. And then after that, it's this big stretch of people who are kind of like, yeah, a bit, or not so much, or if, you, if I have to. And I think that's quite an interesting finding because it, to me, we kind of perhaps might characterise the mid 60s as sort of the apex of religiosity in Australia. And it probably was, but for so many people, 
that was more in name rather than deed. So it's really our Orthodox believers and to a lesser extent, our private believers who are the ones engaging in religious practice and the rest, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to pray that often. I'm definitely not going to get involved in uh, church meetings, as you can see with our secularists there. I'm definitely not going to tune into anything on television or radio if I can help it. Uh, and, you know, morality can be whatever it needs to be. And, of course, they have no religious experiences. So what can we say about the faith of Australians? I think that the analysis conf confirms Moll's hunch. So I think he, he was onto something and hopefully he would have liked this. Only a small proportion of adults were highly religious if that comprises committed belief, regular religious practice. And we can extend that by saying a religious lifestyle in which they're at church more than once a week, watching some stuff on the telly uh, and having experiences, decisive religious experiences, feeling a sense of being in the presence of God or saved. Only a small proportion. And another small proportion had regular engagement with religious faith, but, you know, not much more beyond that. The rest sit between, I think, performing their socially expected Christian duty or equivocal and consequential belief or complete indifference to Christianity. And I think this is how small caught the first whispers of a trend away from organised Christianity in the mid-60s, and that, that has gone on since that time. I've done a whole lot more statistical analysis, and I'm, I'm writing a paper uh, that will look at this. But basically, this, this is really interesting to me. Orthodox believers, they're twice as likely to be Catholic as Anglicans. And if you think about Catholics in the, in the 60s before Vatican II, there was an expectation of not just weekly mass attendance, but more often than that, you'd pray the rosary, you'd be educated in the Catholic school system, and you had this kind of effective kind of community that you're involved in. Of course, that's gone completely the other way since uh, um, Vatican II. And we know from recent research that when you look at the most religious Australians, only a tiny proportion of them are Catholics. Of course, the most religious Australians now tend to be Pentecostals or Muslims uh, and some evangelicals. Uh, and this is the other on the flip. The secularists of all stripes were far, far more likely to be Anglicans and you know, Methodists, um, uh, Presbyterians, which became the United Church, than Catholics or Conservative Protestants. Um, conservative Protestants being your, uh, your Lutherans or your Baptists or whatever. So I think what we see here is a pattern of people who are kind of grudgingly drawn into organised religion because if you had some Anglican enculturation, that's what was expected of you. Uh, but in terms of rubber hits the road religion, uh-uh, no. I'll see you at Easter, see you at Christmas, leave me alone the rest of the time. And one of the things that I think was true back then is the denominations with which people identify and obviously the norms and expectations associated with that denominal identity, that's scaffolded into religious practice. And so. We see that particularly with the Catholics at this time. These are our norms and expectations. And that was all the way through into the ways in which they lived their religion. There's other factors that condition all of this too. So Orthodox believers are much more likely to be women than men. Uh, patterns around education. If you lived in uh, a regional area, you're much more likely to be an Orthodox believer than you were, et cetera, et cetera. All the sociology of religion 101 stuff but denominational presence is quite interesting. And I mean, it was a factor in, in social life still in the 1960s. I discovered this book, Basically Protestant Roman Catholic Tensions, which came out in the early 1960s. And, and this massive Catholic church built uh, in Bradley to house all the, the, the Catholic population uh, moving to the Catholic territory. Uh, I presume it's... Is that where it is? Is it? No, it's um on the it's on the corner of the on street and I can I have never been there, but I can tell you how it's a lot more empty like on a Sunday now than it would have been in um 1965, I I guess. Um 
All right, quick postscript. Hans Moll, he'd gone to Canada. He returned uh, from study leave to the ANU in 1983, where he was invited to, to write one of these Alan and Amman books. Um, where he updated with more recent survey data that was available, um, but he didn't have any money to do the new survey himself. And the result is the faith of Australians. Um, for me, it's, I find it quite a disjointed, somewhat tedious book. And uh, I think he's quite harsh about a whole lot of trends. Um, so, you know, if you want to kind of, his original take on the quant stuff, go to religion in Australia. He notes that in the text, he was waiting for data from the 1984 Australian Value Study. I've been waiting for this for years because if you lodge data with the Australian Data Archive, you have to, and you want to use it, you have to get permission from the data owner. And it's, to my mind, they're all retired or dead, the people who own this. So I write all the time, can I have the data? So he was waiting, I'm waiting, and I was still writing emails this week, how about it? So nothing's happening. I had hoped to use some of that data uh, to inform today's presentation, but you know, next year. Thanks. <laughs> um, so he drew on other polls, but it was all secondary data. To my mind, he seemed to be unwilling to think more expansively about the social upheaval of the era between the 1960s and the 1980s and the profound impact it had on the faith of Australians. So he doesn't say much about how the Whitlam government or the Vietnam War, women's lib, the occult revival, which was huge in the 1970s. That's why we had spirit mediums here at ANU. Or most importantly, how migration and also the baby boomers remade Australian religion in the time between his books. So he doesn't have a lot to say about that stuff. To me, that's the, the great disappointment of uh, the second book, because basically it set in play a whole lot of trends, the aftershocks of which are being felt to this day. Still, he's a pioneer and the echoes of his approach are heard today. I didn't quite realize this until I prepared for this talk, but the way he does his stats, uh, it's very similar to the way a guy called Mike Mason, who's an old Catholic sociologist, taught me about 20 years ago. And I kind of realized that Mike was a disciple of Hans Moll, and in turn, I'm kind of a disciple of Mike, who is a disciple of Hans Moll. Uh, I know that's nice, you know, that we're still doing surveys of religion. So whether it's the World Value Survey or the Australian Survey of Social Attitudes or some of the stuff I've done on teenagers, the, the echoes of Hans Moll's kind of approach uh, is still felt today, even though we've updated a little bit. Thank you.